how are you? Shall we study Bible together? Well, now, uh, as you may realize that we just start learning about the uh, Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And uh, I think the Revelation is a really uh, important, very important book. It is the last book, last book of the Bible. And then the, um, also, it's a key to understand the entire mystery about the Bible. Now, uh, so today we're going to learn from Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. The title is uh, A Church Lost the First Love. Now, before I study, uh, before I start a message, uh, shall we pray? Father in heaven, preach, teach us your word. Thank you. Just in pray. Amen. All right. Well, as I said, uh, now we're learning at the Revelation. But when I think about entire Bible, the Bible is a very, very, I would say, amazing and very interesting book. Now, uh, what the Bible revealed to us is that, first of all, the Bible telling us there is the God who is creator. And uh, he, is, he has created everything. And according to the Bible, he created well, his kingdom or his world perfect. And in his kingdom, or well, I would say his world, he uh, also create a, a man and uh, was supposed to, uh, the man live together with God and the relationship with the man and God is bounded by love. We're, we're, we're fellowship uh, God with love. So God loves us so much and we uh, love him so much. And so that it was almost like a God's plan to have a wonderful family uh, type uh, relationship. And then that, that's where we're supposed to live in his kingdom or his world. But God uh, put a tree in the midst of his uh, kingdom. And um, uh, he told men that if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. Why he put that tree? <laughs> he didn't have to, don't you think? But he did. But sure enough, you know, man, the first man, Adam, uh, took that uh, fruits from the tree. I mean, if someone told me, if you eat this, you're going to die, man, I would probably think twice. Or maybe I'm not going to eat it. You know, I mean, if, if somebody told you, you're going to die eating this, you know. Uh, but, you know, sure enough, the... Uh, we, uh, you know, the man, the first man ate that. Uh, first of all, why God put that tree up in there? Um, well, I guess God tests us and um, to see if we really continue to love him or mostly he tests us that we do believe his word or not. Um, and then chose him to live with, you know, chose God uh, as our God and um, now so the entire Bible is really is how God going to regain us uh, to his kingdom it's uh, uh, he's really telling us how he's going to bring us back to his kingdom and then the uh, Old Testament revealed to us that God will come and um, he's going to send a title called a son of man and son of man is a king and he's God that he will come and establish his kingdom so that he can bring people into his ideal, God's ideal place. And uh, you will see in uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 it's written like this. I was watching in the night vision and with a cloud of the sky one like a son of man was approaching. He went up to the ancient of days and was escorted before him. To him was given ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty. All peoples, nations, and language groups were serving him. His authority is eternal and will not pass away. His kingdom will not be destroyed. That's a very interesting statement. Now, the, the title, Son of Man, is really given to Jesus and uh, he's the one, the king of all the nations. He's not the king only for Israel, but he's also king of entire, entire people, all the nations, all the language groups. So that the title, Son of Man, Son of Man, 
means is a king, is coming king, Messiah. Um, definitely the Old Testament people waited for him and the Jewish people by then that he thought the Messiah or the Son of Man will establish their kingdom uh, even though the Bible says he's going to establish the entire human kingdom and uh, but nevertheless uh, Jesus came and uh, he claimed himself I am the Son of Man and um, uh, he told people now the kingdom of God is not come near because I'm here he, I'm a king um, now uh, he was supposed to let the people into his kingdom but it's not easy because if God allow people to get into God's kingdom God have to uh, forgive their sin uh, you know, the, the, the people uh, continue to do the lots of evil, evil, bad things. See, God is so righteous, righteous God. He cannot forgive uh, evil things. He cannot say, oh, the evil things, that's nothing. He cannot erase it. He cannot say, that's okay, you're a bad guy, but it's okay. You come. The person has to pay the price. person has to really uh, you know, be punished by doing bad he had to pay uh, a penalty of his sin and uh, what God did was that the, 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 this king in order to in order for God to forgive the people's sin the, uh, this king paid everything he had to pay off the debt that we had he he even uh, 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 you know, lost his glory as a deity and he came to earth and he even lost his entire body and blood. He gave everything. He became penniless. Uh, he just gave uh, more than penniless. He just gave all total himself to pay and purchase us. And his blood, uh, Jesus' blood, purchased entire, entire human beings, sin, being forgiven and Jesus said, now, I paid, guys, I paid every human's um, sin, so all you have to do is come to me. And the question is, the people who believed his word or not. Now is good news. This is a time everyone who will come to Jesus, the person's sin will be forgiven. This is a great, because he paid for you. Uh, this simple truth that unfortunately some people accept and some people won't. So people who do not believe in his word or his invitation, that his word will judge them at the end. And um, so the entire Christian, uh, Christian history, that all the churches understand that Jesus will come back. His first visit to us was to save us but his second visit we're going to judge us now uh let me read john chapter 12 verse 47 to 48 if anyone hears my word and does not obey them i do not judge him for i have not come to judge the world but to save the world the one who reject me and does not accept my words has a judge the word I have spoken will judge him at the last day now so Jesus clearly indicate that he came at first as a king and he paid the penalty of a sin on the cross and he resurrected if accept his invitation he's just telling us he he paid he paid for you you're totally free to come into the God's kingdom this is a time He's welcoming us to go into his kingdom. But some people don't believe that. But he will come back and he's gonna establish kingdom. His second return, his his second coming, his his coming to establish his kingdom, and the people who really accept his word, those people freely can go into his kingdom, but the people who do not he did not accept his word, they'll be judged. So that his second coming, that Jesus is going to be our king and 
God himself and at the same time he's a high priest but at the same time he is the God of judge now uh, when he showed up to John his appearance as you see in the slide was like this it's really indicate his deity as a white white hairs is really similar to the ancient days his his father his, his, Jesus appear as God deity at the same time he appear like a high priest and he really appear as a king so what 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 is whole point is that um, Jesus telling us that he's coming back and this time he gonna judge us the all the evil doer but then also what the Bible revealed to us is that Jesus going to judge us church first so the book of Revelation interesting enough that first chapter 2 and 3 he really going to tell us the church about warning about the his judgment on church and then that is uh, and let me read the first Peter chapter 4 verse 17 and 18 for it is time for judgment to begin starting with the house of God and if it starts with us what will be the fate of those who are disobedient to the gospel of God and if the righteous are very saved what will become of the ungodly and sinners so the Bible clearly really indicating that that uh, Jesus when he come back he going to question us church first and so the book of Revelation starting from chapter 2 that we're gonna learn today that he's really telling church about what he think about us and let's now read Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 to the angel of the church in Ephesus write the following this is the solemn pronouncement of the one who has firm grips on the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven golden lampstand now the Jesus appear as a total judgment of the church so he has seven stars and then the, his walk among the seven lampstand but this seeing he's actually telling to the church of Ephesus now why the Ephesus because Ephesus is the first church and really that he's seen like telling us is a really beginning of the all the churches and uh, let me show you where the Ephesus is if you look at the map of Ephesus Ephesus locating that where the uh, this map say number one here and uh, uh, the Ephesus is a really the town it's a port town so the, all the goods coming to Ephesus, uh, including the letters, was uh, traveling through the, the uh, there's a, a route uh, to the Ephesus to the next uh, town called Smyrna, and next is uh, uh, Pergamos and so on. So the Ephesus is really a starting point of all these uh, uh, seven churches. And then the, uh, also, uh, Ephesus is a very interesting town. Uh, Ephesus has a, uh, uh, it's a center of this entire uh, region called uh, Anatolia, uh, Ana uh, Anatolia. And um, Ephesus also had the, uh, the Roman government building. So the town of Ephesus or church of Ephesus really emphasized it is under the influence of a Roman government because that this town Ephesus is really under the direct control of a Roman Empire at the same time uh, this church has uh, 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 now the, if you see the picture of the Ephesus now it's a kind of ruin right now it's, uh, it's no one really lived in a city called Ephesus anymore but then the, uh, this town also had the big temple of Artemis and uh, now this temple of Artemis uh, it's a Artemis is actually a goddess. Uh, it's a it's a female god, and then it looks like this. Now, if you see uh, this picture, this is a very very strange uh, statue because this female has lots lots, uh, you know, breast. I mean, uh, the <laughs> booty. I mean, I mean, well, so because Artemis is a goddess, this is supposed to be she. Why why she have so many uh, you know things and uh, she has so many uh, booths? Because uh, Artemis is a fraternity 
uh, uh, God. She 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 brings lots of baby. She's actually the god goddess of uh, pregnancy kind of, and she gave birth easy and uh, 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 fertility a uh, photo photo. She is the one going to bring the other photo land, and um, also people start to believe that uh, she's the one going to give the birth and the life, and she's really the uh, the source of the life. And that is kind of a belief they have. So the Ephesus is a very, uh, 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 you know, big city, and it is the starting of the church. And also uh, that we can say this is a city is a very much uh, how I say Gentile city. Now verse two and three, uh, the Jesus actually give a, 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 a you know comment, the, give the good comment about this church uh, about the verse two and three. Let me read that. I know your works as well as your labor and steadfast endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have even put to the test those who refer to them, themselves as apostles but are not, and have discovered that they are false. I am also aware that you have persisted steadfastly endure much for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. Now very interesting the Jesus really told them that you did a very good job by finding the false apostle. Uh, the Jesus said I know everything about you guys I'm watching you guys see God he knows everything Jesus knows everything but we have to understand he is our king at the same time, he is our judge. See, everything we do at the church or whatever, you know, he knows it. We can hide from our God. And uh, then he told this church, Ephesus, that you guys did a very good job finding the false apostle. Now, uh, you probably wonder why, why there is a false apostle. Apparently, at the uh, first century uh, up to the 180 the time the church just started there is a lot lots lots uh, how I say uh, confusion maybe in a the theology and there's a lot lots uh, misleading uh, 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 teaching like such as uh, Gnosticism or some, some other religions and then those leaders seems going around now there's a warning apparently if you read uh, act chapter uh, uh, 20, the Apostle Paul, the, he actually uh, uh, asked people, uh, uh, leader of the Ephesus to come to see him and then the Paul uh, uh, gave them warning in uh, chapter 20 in the book of Acts that uh, there will be a you know, bad leader or some guy going to confuse you guys or uh, you know, the false apostle will come to you guys. Let me read the Acts chapter 20. Uh, verse 17 and 29 and 30 from Miletus he sent a message to Ephesus telling the elders of the church to come to him I know that after I am gone fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock even from among your own groups men will rise teaching perversions of the truth to draw the disciples away after them. Now that is a very interesting. Uh, Paul was kind of warning Ephesus already the time that he's leaving at the Asian Minor and he asked uh, people, the elder of the Ephesus, now presume there's a false prophet or a false apostle will come. So watch out guys. A apparently the time the uh, you know uh, you know the apostle John and the Paul was there. Uh, there's a lots lots of false teaching was going on, and even the church and the Corinthian, you see the uh, uh, Paul also warned the people in the Corinthian. Let me read that the Second Corinthian, chapter eleven, verse thirteen and fourteen. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostle of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. What's surprising is that Paul uh, really saying 
to the people in the Corinthian and other churches, including Ephesus, they see that uh, those false apostles is really like uh, like a Satan's. That's a very strong word. Is they are they are really disguising, and they pretend to be real, but they are not. They are they are liar. And then uh, they, you know, so the Paul is comparing this false apostle, comparing to the Satan's. The the Satan is disguising people. That is a very strong uh, uh, statement, which means this false apostle. It's like a really devil Satan's uh, attack on church. But in the Jesus telling the Ephesian church, you guys did a very good job finding the false doctrine, false teaching, and you found who is wrong apostle. Now, let me ask you a kind of strange question. Do you know what's the difference between apostle and disciple? Do you remember that Jesus had the 12 disciples? Well, uh, well, <laughs> the disciple is actually uh, people who believe in Jesus, uh, Jesus are following him. The follower of Jesus is a disciple, so we are disciple. And uh, and uh, book of Matthew, uh, chapter twenty-eight, Jesus told us that you go to all the nation in the world and make disciple of him and Jesus. So disciple is really follower of Jesus, but an apostle. Is a special disciple, and apostle is the one that uh, Jesus Himself uh, appoint them to really uh, uh, be a, like a, a messenger of Jesus' uh, work. He, they're, they're, Jesus really handpicked the uh, His worker, and so the uh, the twelve disciple is twelve apostle, and also Bible reveal. There are very few people that are considered to be apostles, such as Paul be apostle, uh, and uh, Barnabas is apostle, and there's another one guy uh, named uh, uh, Apollo uh, being called as an apostle, but then uh, not that many, uh, only 12 plus few. But see, which means the word apostle means really the top leader of the church. Everybody should obediently listen. To the apostle and their teaching, they are the this is their head teacher, and so this false apostle, they are saying, "I am apostle," but they are not. They are saying saying that they are the they are the they are the uh, leader of the church, but they are not. This kind of remind me, I guess, in our modern day, we have to be careful because some uh, church leader, even though some person or some minister, they may not have the uh, proper the, uh, theological training such as uh, you know well usually to be a pastor or minister of the church uh, usually people go to the well-known uh, well-established seminary uh, to study the theology uh, but uh, you know some church maybe but well, some person he or she may possibly uh, self claim to be a minister or pastor and that's a disguise really and teaching not Christianity or some other wrong doctrine, they pretend to be Christianity, and that is a really satanic uh, uh, work, and that is really, we see that is all the cult religions uh, that pretend to be church, uh, they, they apparently not. And so either way, the, this Ephesian church did a very good job finding these false uh, 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 doctrines and the false apostles. So Jesus really uh, commented them. Jesus really said, that you, you guys are doing a very good job. And, however, the, uh, verse 4, Jesus really uh, mocked them and told them that they didn't do a good job. Uh, let me uh, uh, move on to verse 4. But I have this against you. You have departed from your first love. Wow, that's interesting. Jesus told them, you guys did a very good job finding or kicking out the uh, false doctrines, but you really lost your first love. Now, what is the first love? The first love is really the first love told to Jesus Himself. And uh, see, entire Christian doctrines, you know, the most important command is really to love God and love neighbor. And uh, Jesus is. God and the man. So loving Jesus really fulfilled that we love God and that we love men. Uh, see, 
the God's relation that He wants in the kingdom of God is a relationship of love that we, sh we, sh we love God and God loves us. God is actually testing us that do really do we really love Him? And uh, He tests us. We if we love Him, we will be obedient to Him. We're gonna to listen to His word, and so constantly. This is a time that God told the Ephesian church that you guys did very good job finding the wrong person. But you probably because they become so judgmental, I would say. They have to judge who's right and who's wrong. Oh, that guy's wrong, that she's wrong. They lost uh, their, their, their first love. See, we are very, we human, we easy, we, are, we have a tendency to easily pointing out the other people's faults. Uh, we are very easy on ourselves, but we are very hard on others. And uh, you know, if we did, if I did something bad, I would say, oh yeah, because of, because of that, because of this, I'm gonna make a bunch of excuses, and that's why, yeah, I'm sorry, but you know, you know that. But see, if somebody else did it, we don't listen to their excuse. We say, you are bad, you are bad, she's bad. <sighs> that's the nature we have, and there's no love. You know, there's no kindness, love, or understanding. That's very, very sad. Especially I see a church who are really start making their, their church work to be like an obligation rather than really love. See, everything we do at the church really the steam out from the love. We should. Uh, but in uh, some church, the, it's a, instead of a love, uh, it becomes an obligation. To do the work and like uh, oh the pastor told me to do this or the church leader told me to do this since I'm a church leader I have to do this do that and this is the obligation I have to attend the Bible study I have to do this I have to and then if people don't do it the other people say oh he's not doing good she's not doing well at the church uh, ministry did that, 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 that I see the church like that you know uh, there, there's a easy we kind of uh, really uh, judging others each other. But then there's no love. Uh, that's sad. So Ephesian church apparently like that. Uh, now, but but then the one more things. Uh, the verse five that Jesus told the Ephesian church. Let me see. Therefore, remember, from what high state you have fallen, and repent. Do the deed you did at the first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That is, if you do not repent. Now, what the Jesus can continue to say, see, you lost the first love, and not only that, if you don't regain the first love, I'm talking about that, that uh, he's going to remove the lampstand from your place. Now, the lampstand signified the church. So basically, what the Jesus is telling the Ephesian church is, if you do not, uh, if you don't have a first love, then you're not church. <laughs> He, he, you are not his church at all. Uh, that's very <laughs> sad and scary. Uh, see, uh, the church without the love is really the dead church. Uh, you know, uh, see the lampstand is where you have a light. So the church is supposed to be the, the source of the light in this dark world. And when people come to the church, this is the church is the only place they feel the kingdom of God. That they feel this is the place the people who are going to uh, kingdom of God that they they have a full taste of kingdom of God. The, the love love and kindness with uh, uh, first we have a love relationship with God, and uh, we love other member of the church, and so people start to feel that love in the church. But if the church do not have love. Then that is not church. That see, I, I see the church without love, a lost love. That church is not shining. Uh, you know, there's no really joy in the church. It, they just everybody doing, just doing under the obligations, and kind of that's a kind of sad. so Jesus told, hey, you guys have to repent. That is a, apparently the efficient church. Now, however, verse six, he also added very interesting things. Let me read verse 6. But you do have this going for you. You hate what the Nicol uh, Nicol Nicolaitans uh, practice. Practice I also hate. Now, very interesting that Jesus told 
that after you guys lost the love, uh, first love, and you have regained that, but then, uh, this, but then Jesus said, but however, however uh, the, you have one thing uh, it's okay, that is uh, you hate uh, the uh, practice of uh, Nicolaitans. Now, what is a Nicolaitans? Um, now, that's kind of a mystery, but then, um, if you see the next slides, there are the two guys I'd like to introduce and to explain about Nicolaitan because these two guys are very important and these two guys telling us what is the Nicolaitan is the, uh, let me show the uh, next slide the first person is a polycarp and the next person uh, Irenaeus now these two a person is absolutely important uh, the early Christian uh, leaders or fathers and um, uh, Polycarp as you see the dates that he lived he really lived uh, the day that uh, uh, Apostle John was uh, alive and then the Polycarp uh, he was uh, uh, the pastor at the church of uh, Smyrna and actually both of men they they're both of them from a town called Smyrna and the next next church uh, that we're gonna learn next week and then Polycarp, uh, he really, uh, you know, that oh, he's a direct disciple of the John, and so that uh, he knows a lot about first century things. And actually, the Polycarp is the one that uh, taught Irenaeus later. That, uh, by the way, Irenaeus went to the Polycarp uh, church, and so the when the Irenaeus was a young man, the Polycarp was a minister there. So the Irenaeus later on uh, wrote the many books, and Irenaeus taught. Uh, us about what the Polycarp said about the first century uh, church and Polycarp said actually he actually met so many uh, eyewitness of the Jesus resurrection so the Jesus resurrection is a really eyewitness count and and also Polycarp told the Irenaeus about the uh, in the first century there was a group called Nicoretians and the Polycarp told Irenaeus who is Nicoretian so the Irenaeus later on he wrote the books uh, well, actually, Irenaeus is a key person as well in the Christian history. Irenaeus, uh, in the really uh, first and second century, that he really, uh, how would I say, combat with the false teaching, and Irenaeus really uh, the key figure of uh, selecting, uh, the canonizing the New Testament. And as he writing his writing, he talking about this group called Nicoret Nicoretians in the first century. Uh, this is actually a guy named Nicholas, that, which is written in the book of Acts. Uh, let me read in the book of uh, Acts, chapter 6, verse 4 and 6. There is a guy named Nicholas. Uh, let me read that. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That proposal pleased the entire group. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, with Philip, uh, Pro Procius, uh, Nicona, Timon, uh, Parmen pa pa Parmenas, and Nicholas, a gentle convert to Judaism from Antioch. They stood, these, they stood these men before the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. Uh, do you remember in the book of Acts, uh, the apostle or leader of the church, uh, Peter and so on, they have become so busy. So they appoint like uh, you know, uh, 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 deacons or the or, you know to take care of the church uh, uh, matter, and then one of the guy they appointed in the Jerusalem church was a guy named Nicholas. He is a Gentile. He was originally Gentile, but he converted to Judaism that, back then. So Nicholas is one of the key figure on the uh, Jerusalem church. But apparently, according to Irenaeus. The Nicholas seems has a kind of bad reputation about his kind of a, how I say, uh, like adultery. He seems let his wife having affair with other guys, and he himself having probably affair. But Nicolidia maybe it is they gonna brought and say, hey, the church is uh, we should love each other. So all those uh, you know the filthy or adultery or the bad thing we should forgive those people and uh, you know we, we are weak so the Nicolaitan permit those uh, nasty practice in the church maybe so I guess that what the Ephesian church is really uh, doing good job is really shutting out this Nicolaitan practice of uh, you know uh, bringing in the church is a dirty act or like um, uh, uh, the moral corruption 
to the church. So then Jesus said, yeah, I, I like I like that too. The you know uh, the ch I think church is a very it's sometimes very difficult where the church stands. It says if we if we church found the immoral act, uh, we shouldn't be judgmental, but at the same time, we shouldn't let the people permit those uh, nasty act going on in the church. So uh, I think what the Jesus says, hey hey uh, Ephesian church, you guys are very good at it. Uh, finding the false doctrine and very good at it, uh, protecting purity fr uh, from the uh, purity of the church, but yet you guys are very terribly bad the judging people. And I think this is the church pointing finger at each other, say, "Oh, she's wrong, he's wrong." See, uh, this is not. I mean, how about our church? Unfortunately, in the 21st century church, many church that we we should love each other but in the, you know the church we hate is a church next door sometimes oh that church is a different denomination from my mind uh, that church is uh, that's the, the church that church practiced we don't do that but where is the love we, we see we christians sometimes very very easy easily we judge other christians or other church so now we have to understand that this is the warning that Jesus as a king and our God and our judge he's telling us to us in the Ephesian church um, don't be judgmental <laughs> basically <laughs> and do not lose your love um, uh, towards to God and people uh, you gotta be stand firm with your doctrine yes you gotta stand firm with the purity of the church yes that that is sure that is that is very important, but at the same time we should not lose the love. And um, then uh, continue to read in the next verse, in the uh, last verse, verse seven. The one who has the ear, uh, uh, ear had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquered, I will permit him to eat from the tree of life that is in the uh, paradise of God. Now, the verse 7 indicate that if you really understand the church, that you will stand firm with the doctrine of the uh, 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 correct doctrines and the, you know, keep the uh, immoral, immorality out from the church, uh, but at the same time, you keep love, that you are victor. And uh, those people uh, who are entering the kingdom of God, that Jesus said, I will give you the fruits from the, uh, the, the fruit, the life, the tree of the life. Now, that may be a, a compare with uh, the godness of Artemis, who was supposed, she was supposed to be giving the life. She was supposed to be a fraternity God that she's the one going to give the life. Uh, but then the true God is the one going to give the true life. She's a fake. She's, she's, she's a fake, a fake God, uh, even though she has a humongous temple. So maybe that was the truth of a life being mentioned here, uh, or regaining uh, from the Genesis, the way we lost the paradise, that Jesus will come back as a king, and he will come back second time as a judge. And he judging the church first, and he warning us that, hey, Ephesian church, you should not lose the first love. And that's where that he's really uh, warning us. Ephesian church is a really pinnacle uh, uh, or indication what is uh, what the first century church was like. And so the many churches now uh, uh, are like that in uh, our century as well. So we gotta be watch out. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your teaching and teaching us about the warning that Jesus gave to us through the Ephesian church. Uh, the, uh, we, we, sh we don't want to be like Ephesian church. We, that is a great, great uh, teaching, Lord. Thank you. Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.